What's up? I'm B, and whether you're watching this on YouTube or you are listening to the podcast, I hope you are having an amazing day. This is my second attempt at filming this video because I tried to do it yesterday and I got about 15 minutes in and then I brought up the topic of Dave Hollis because this is my review of going to Rachel Hollis's live show in Phoenix and I realized that this is the first time um, that I had spoken about Dave on my channel since he passed away and so it brought up a lot of complex emotions for me and I just spoke about it for a little bit and then I just couldn't really get back on track. So I took a break, I'm trying again, and I just want to start out the video by addressing the fact that I have not spoken about Dave since he passed away and now he's going to inevitably come up in this video because again, I'm talking about Rachel Hollis's live show and um, Heidi Powell pops up throughout the story. So um, I, I just want to address it because it feels weird to not say anything and just keep the video going. I stand by the criticisms that I provided of Dave Hollis's public actions and words. However, that doesn't take away that anything that I might criticize him for does not take away from the real life impact he had on the people who knew him personally and loved him. And despite being a flawed individual struggling with addiction, he meant a lot to the people who loved him. And in speaking about him on my channel, I am not doing it with any sort of intention to disrespect him or cause any harm whatsoever. As always, I try to be respectful and stay above the belt with everybody that I talk about, but I feel it necessary to reiterate it, especially within this circumstance. Dave, like literally every other human being on earth, had his own struggles and issues, but that doesn't take away from who he was as a person to those who loved him. It's very emotionally confusing when you have a parasocial relationship with someone where you know who they are because they're a public figure and you criticize them and now they are no longer with us. It's um, it causes a lot of reflection, I think. I mean, I know it did for me when he passed away of just racking my brain of like, oh my goodness, I spoke negatively about this person's actions and now they're no longer here. How do I feel about that? Do I feel okay with the things that I said? Do I stand by the things that I said? And at the end of the day, I do stand by the criticism that I gave him. But again, I know that he had people in his life who loved him so much. He was a father. He was a friend. He was a son. And I wish nothing but the best for those who loved him and are struggling to continue processing what happened and live their lives without this person that they love. So again, Dave Hollis will be coming up in this video, but I will only bring him up when necessary and as related to the questions that y'all asked me about Rachel Hollis's live show. And with that, I'm going to move on to the video. I am not going to get lost rambling like I did yesterday. Before we get into my review of Rachel Hollis's live show and answering your questions about what happened, I do want to hear your win for the week. If you are newer to my channel, a win for the week is where you tell me something that happened to you within the past week that was fun, that was enjoyable, that made you happy, big or small, whatever it is. If you're watching on YouTube, you can leave it in the comment section down below. And if you're listening to the podcast on Spotify, you can leave it in the Q&A for this particular uh, episode. And my win for the week is that over the weekend, I got to go to Top Golf with my dad and my sisters. It was my first time going, and so uh, predictably, I was not great, but I did have a great time. So that's my win for the week, and I cannot wait to hear yours and celebrate with you. Before I get into answering your questions, I just want to talk a little bit about this tour and give some necessary context and chat a little bit about how the tour is being promoted because I think it's really interesting. A few years ago, if you said Rachel Hollis was going to be speaking at an event, that would get you so much attention and so much profit from people buying tickets just to see her. When Rachel was in her prime, she was like, she was everywhere. She was giving motivational speeches. She was selling out conferences. She was speaking at 
um, Arbonne conventions and Beachbody conventions as their keynote speaker. She was highly sought after and a lot of people looked up to her. But because of a variety of things that have happened over the past few years, public demand and public interest in Rachel Hollis has shifted in that it has decreased and there are a lot of people who now keep up with her not because they want to learn from her and hear what she has to say and see her as a mentor, um, but because they're noticing the things that she used to put out and is still putting out that they don't agree with that they feel is misleading or harmful or just odd. And so public perception of Rachel Hollis has shifted over the past few years and she's no longer being hired as a keynote speaker for massive events. Instead, she is putting on her own smaller tours. And the last time she did a live tour, if I'm remembering correctly, it was a Rage Talks live tour. And people went and they reported that when they went, it seemed like the venue might have been a little bit too big for the audience. I saw a few pictures. I read some blog posts of people who went to go see these shows and they said there were just empty rows. It wasn't really the kind of show that they were expecting from Rachel Hollis. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think I saw this in a Kia's World video. There were certain cities that ended up either dropping out of the tour or getting canceled for the exact reason I can't quite remember, but overall that tour did not seem to do particularly well. And so when I heard that she was going on tour again, I was very interested to see what would be happening with it. And right now this tour, it's a live podcast tour. It's called Happy in the Same Pants. And I think she's gonna be going to 12 cities. If you look at the poster online, there's six cities that are listed that have been announced. And then on the other side, there's six lines of text that are blurred out. And so I'm not sure if that's because they haven't confirmed those additional cities or if it's kind of like a marketing tactic of um, like, keep coming back to my Instagram, keep generating interest for me in the algorithm by checking to see if I'm coming to a city near you. It could be either one of those explanations or it could be a combination of both. But either way, she might be coming to a city near you. And when I heard she was coming to Phoenix, I was like, okay, let me look into this a little bit more. Let's see what's going on. And if you watch the promotional video for it, it gives kind of a mixed message of what it's going to be. And now I can definitely say that because I went to see the show. And so I want to show you the promotional video and see what your thoughts are on it. I'll go ahead and play it for you now. Hi guys, it's Rachel Hollis here. If we are not already friends, uh, let me introduce myself. I am taking my podcast on tour this summer and I'm coming to a city near you. The intention behind this podcast tour is to get in a room with a bunch of other people and laugh our butts off. Laugh until we pee our pants just a little bit because honestly, it's been a really freaking hard year. There's something healing that happens when you can get together with other people and giggle and laugh and let it all come out. So that's what we're gonna do. Anyone had a waxer tell them to flip over and you're like, for what purpose, Sharon? Okay, let me tell you how this tour is a little bit different than what you might have seen me do before. The first part of the evening is stories and jokes and stuff that is mostly going to make sense if you have ever had a period before. Like, I just wanna talk about all the weird things that are put on us as women. Can we just be real in this room? If you wax this regularly, can I get a, can I get a hand, okay? If you shave this regularly, okay? If it's 1972 here, <laughs> can I get a truth bomb? We're just gonna talk about anything and everything. Expect to laugh. We are passing rock-sized clots of blood and continuing to live our lives. The end of the evening, we're doing Q&A moments with members of the audience where we can get real. We can talk about hard stuff and good stuff and how we're gonna get from here to there. Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, no, if you raise your hands, like, you're in. <laughs> you were looking for a girl's night. If you are looking for something that you can let loose just a little bit, I intentionally planned every single stop on this tour inside a place that will sell you a beer. You should do with that information what you will. Call somebody, call, call your best friend, call your neighbor, call your coworker, be like boop, boop, boop. 
because it's 1997 when you're making this call. Hey, hey girl, yeah, come, come on, we're gonna laugh. We're gonna pee our pants a little bit, so you need to wear a panty liner. And also, yes, we can have a Chablis. I know, it's amazing. I don't normally say this, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it this time. You should leave your man at home. You should leave your man at home unless you got yourself the kind of man that can handle a conversation with a bunch of people laughing about getting their period. Okay, give it up for Mitchell. <laughs> who is in the front row listening to me talk about my pubes. Come by yourself. You will have so much fun. You will meet like-minded people who are your community. You will be able to connect and you will not have to do it with Jason's weird energy permeating next to you and spreading around to everyone around you. So don't bring that guy. I hope you'll come hang out with me guys and we can laugh and we can have fun and maybe we cry a little, but we learn something and we go out into the world filled back up and ready to be the incredible leaders that we are. Okay, so you get the impression it's gonna be a lot of menstruation talk, which I don't know, if, if, if people seek out that kind of content and they find it relatable and they enjoy it, that's great. For me, I was like, if I end up getting a ticket to this and, and going to the show, I hope that's not what the whole thing is because I just don't, I, I don't vibe with that kind of content. It's not something where I'm like, yeah, let's talk about periods. <laughs> not because of any like particular reason. It's just like, for me, I don't really need to sit through a comedy show if that's what this is going to be about people having periods, right? But so that was the promotional video. And then I decided to look at tickets and see how much they were and if I was going to go. And on the, so Rachel came to stand up live, which is in downtown Phoenix. And it was on a Wednesday at 7 p.m. So when I went to the ticket page, it said, join Rachel Hollis, number one New York Times bestselling author, world renowned motivational speaker, and the host of the wildly popular podcast, cleverly titled The Rachel Hollis Podcast, as she tests out brand new material for her upcoming podcast tour. So I guess this is kind of like a test run. And then later, maybe she's going to do something with a with larger venues or on a larger scale. I don't know, but it goes on to say, will it be motivational? Always. Will it be funny? God, we hope so. Will there be a Q&A in the unique real talk style that Rach is known for? And because Rach is basically a toddler who likes to be in bed at a reasonable hour, Stand Up Live is going to move up the showtime to an hour earlier at 7 p.m. Because the only thing better than having a drink and laughing with your friends is getting enough sleep so you're not hungover. Now, that paragraph caught me a little bit off guard. I mean, I know Rachel makes those kind of jokes all the time, but logically I'm like, toddlers do not like going to bed at a reasonable hour. So one, that doesn't make sense. But Rachel's a toddler who wants to drink, but early enough in the evening so that way she can go to bed at a reasonable hour and wake up without a hangover. We're getting some confusing messaging here. And really the thing that kind of struck a chord with me about that paragraph is the joke about avoiding a hangover. And the reason that it caught me off guard and really stuck out to me is not because I have an issue with people joking about having hangovers. If anybody else said that joke, I probably wouldn't think twice about it. But with Rachel openly talking about how she used to have an alcohol problem and used to have a dependency problem, but she no longer has it so she can drink every now and then and giving really confusing messaging on that, that's why it bothered me. I, again, if it was anybody else, I would not think twice about that joke. But for somebody who has spoken about struggling with dependency on alcohol, I don't know, it struck me wrong. I don't wanna be like, uptight and snooty and like, you can't joke about that. But I don't, it's confusing to me if you're saying that you struggled with something, um, but then you like diminish the impact that that struggle had by making jokes about it and not jokes in a gallows humor kind of sense, because that comes from a place of a coping, but jokes from a place of saying like, I had this struggle. I, I, you know, fought this battle and guess what? I'm okay, and now I can drink again, even though I used to have an alcohol dependency. That's just me. That's how I felt about it. Again, it's just my opinion. So anyway, that was the blurb on the ticket site, and I went back and forth on it for a little bit. I wasn't sure if I was going to go. I didn't really want to go by myself because 
I'm an introvert and I uh, like staying at home if I'm going to be alone and I like being with my husband or my friends or my family if I'm going somewhere in public. And Rick did offer to go with me. He's a supporter. I love him very much. A supporter of me, not of Rachel. But Rachel had recently sent out this kind of set of guidelines for anybody who was going to the show. And Number four was you should definitely leave your man at home. Okay, normally I don't say this. Normally I'm like, everyone is welcome. Just make sure your man can handle some menstruation talk. But at a recent show, someone brought her husband and well, he was basically the worst. He was such a bad vibe to everyone around him and he totally yucked her yum, meaning he came with her but made sure to be such a douche lord that she couldn't possibly enjoy herself. So, don't bring your hubs, your boyfriend, or your brother unless they will find jokes about periods hilarious. Seriously, there have been men in every crowd who are peeing their pants laughing. Those dudes are my kind of dudes, but if you're not sure if your man is one of those, he's not. Bring your bestie, your coworker, or honestly, just come alone and make great new friends. I promise it'll be way better. So yeah, I read that and I'm like, my husband is 6'5 and very noticeable. He turns heads where he goes. So I'm not sure if me trying to blend in is going to work out super well if I bring him along. Um, so I was very nervous, but I was like, I'm going to get a ticket. I'm going to go. I'm going to try and have a good time. The venue has a two drink minimum. And so I'm like, I'll go. I'll have a Tito soda. I will just watch the show and see how I feel about it. And so I went I stayed through the show. I talked to a few different people afterwards. And now I'm going to go ahead and answer your questions that you guys submitted about what went down. The first question I'm going to answer says, what even is the show? Comedy, self-help, an obvious cash grab? And let me tell you, there is no easy answer to this question. So the first half of the show was kind of like a stand-up routine, really. I mean, she comes out and she talks about how she had rewritten this show a few times the day before and God, she hopes you like it and you pee your pants laughing. And um, she had told the story of how she came up with the name for the show called Happy in the Same Pants. And it was interesting because she had, she told the story about how every parent has like that difficult or defiant child. And that was one of her older sisters. And her sister would always say like, I'm mad, I'm angry. She didn't hesitate to tell you how she felt. And it's kind of funny because she said in the show that her sister was beautiful and all beautiful girls are kind of mean. And people started laughing and she was like, you laugh, but like, you know, it's true. If you're in here and you're beautiful, you're sitting here thinking to yourself, yeah, I'm a little bit of a bitch. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. That's an interesting joke to make about your sister, but as long as y'all are cool with it, great. Uh, but so her sister would always say like, I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm mad. And one day her mom looked at her and said, yeah, well, you can get happy in the same pants. And so she thought that that phrase was amazing. She loved it. And that's where the thought behind this show came from is that you can be happy in the same pants and it's kind of relevant because the past few years have been really tough for a lot of people especially her and you know she thought a few years back like I've learned all the hard lessons I've got it I'm good to go and then the next year was tough and the next year was tough too and so that's why she wanted to talk about that there were a few other stories that she told, but I know people asked about them and other questions, so I'll wait to share kind of the information about that until later. But she, the first half was like kind of a comedy show. And I'll be honest, like I said, my intention was to go there and just see what was going on, see if it was funny. I went in with an open mind. I wasn't going in there being like, this is going to be awful and I hate it. So I'm there. I'd spoken with the lady next to me because when I first went into the venue. Um, it's like all of these communal tables. So you don't have like rows of seats. It's tables, it's food, it's single people here, 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 here. So me and this one woman had gotten sat next to each other, but it turned out that that table had been reserved for somebody else. And so they moved both of us. And we were at the first table like directly to the right of the stage. And I was at the very end. And so when Rachel comes out, if she looked down to the end of our table, that's where I'm sitting, the front table directly to her right. And I will be honest, for a while, I was kind of sitting off to the side. 
and like trying to hide behind the person in front of me because not that Rachel Hollis has any idea who I am but if on the off chance she's like I've seen that face before in a video that was criticizing me I did not want to make anybody feel uncomfortable or draw any undue attention to myself I was literally just trying to go and observe and vibe so yeah, that's uh, where I was sitting. And eventually throughout the show, I'm like, all right, she's got a spotlight on her. She's probably not going to be able to see my face. I can scoot over to the next spot. But anyway, this lady who was sitting next to me, we had chatted a little bit and I noticed she was laughing. Everybody was having a good time for like the first half of the show. It was interesting because Rachel seemed a little bit um, unsure of herself, which I'm not necessarily used to seeing. And again, I've never seen her in person before, so I don't know exactly how she is when she does live events, but it did seem like she was a little bit tentative in coming out and doing this show. But as the show went on, she got a little bit more comfortable. And so during the comedy section, like the first half of the show, I thought that it went really well. A lot of the jokes and stories were ones that I had heard before and so I was fighting the urge within my brain to like fact check certain details that she was providing in these stories and I'm just like if I didn't know who Rachel Hollis was or I didn't have a negative opinion of certain things that she's done and, and this was my kind of comedy and humor I'd be having a good time here. Then we get to the Q&A section which I don't know exactly what I thought it was going to be or how long it was going to go. In my head, when somebody says they're doing a Q&A, I tend to think that it's like, ask me questions that you want to know about me and I will answer them. But in this case, she picked out two questions. She only answered two questions and they were about um, her helping other people with things. And Rachel had said that when her son was going around collecting the questions, she had really wanted him to like angle people to get very specific in certain things that they were struggling with. And so uh, she read the questions out and then she had the people who had asked them raise their hand. And the first woman was uh, somebody who had said that she was struggling with her son who was... 10 or 11, I can't remember the exact age, um, but being like addicted to technology and she didn't know what to do because nobody else could help with that. And so Rachel has her stand up and she's poking and prodding and asking different questions about it. And um, I, I don't know how helpful what she ended up telling this woman was is because she had asked her like, well, what's his history? What does he like to do for fun? When does he have downtime? If he's addicted to technology and now you're putting him in a competitive soccer league, does he ever just have time to chill out? And they're just kind of like working through it together. And eventually Rachel just gets to a point where she's like, well, you're like, it sounds like you're speaking from a place of fear. That's a fear that's coming from you when he's going to be okay. He's going to be his own beautiful kind of weird, just like everybody else's. And that was the answer. I don't know. I hope it helped that lady in some way. I hope it made her feel a little bit reassured about her son and that he was going to be okay. And part of it was interesting because she said that he wasn't really making friends in Arizona, but that they had moved around over the past few years and he was on technology talking to his friends from California. And so she was worried about him not making friends here and like being isolated. But I would lean into that and be like, look, he made friends in California. He wants to keep up with them. You know, eventually I'm sure he'll, he will branch out and make friends here. But right now he's still just processing through the transition of moving. Like that was just my thought. But Anyway, I'm not, I'm not part of the q and I do not have the expertise. Nobody should take my advice for anything. But that was the first one. And then the second question was how to parent joyfully when everything's chaotic and you have multiple kids and you're trying to be fulfilled in your own life. And it was <laughs> terrifying because turns out that the people who had asked that question, it was four women who were like there together and had asked that question together directly behind me at the table directly behind me. And the entire podcast was being filmed by Jack from Rachel's podcast. And so he has this big camera and he's walking over and standing right next to me. And I was just like, oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> I do not want to be anywhere near this interaction, but I'm just gonna sit to the side and look back at them and 
pretend that I'm not internally freaking out. So anyway, she asks them if there's anything that causes them to like jump out of bed in the morning because they're so passionate about it and they can't wait to do it. And they all just kind of were like, I'm not really. And Rachel's like, okay, well, it sounds like that's a no if you can't come up with something. But then one of the women said that she liked to run. And so Rachel's like, oh, I I heard running, right? Okay, so you guys should run a half marathon. You should train together. You should go do the Disney half marathon. And then she tells a story about her doing a Disney half marathon. And so that was it for like the Q&A section. She goes into motivational speaker mode. It was like the first half of the show was a little bit awkward, but good vibes. Then we got to the Q&A, which was confusing. And I don't know if anybody else in the audience felt like this, but to me, it felt like the energy short of, sort of um, like took a little dip, took a little downturn. It went from, ah, ha, ha, we're all laughing, we're having a good time, to, oh, this isn't as comedic as it was about 10 minutes ago. All right. Then she starts talking about different circumstances and how sometimes people only do things or choose not to do things because of societal expectations or what they think other people expect of them. And if you want to push yourself, you can do hard things. We go into a lot of period talk, which I'll get into more with other questions. But it's kind of like half comedy, half motivational. And she starts sharing some of her period misfortunes and goes into a whole bit about women menstruating. Like this, this is like kind of aligns with what was shown in her promo video, like a lot of period talk. And she brings in a member of the audience, which I'll talk about later. And just goes in through this whole thing about how like, you know, that women can do hard things because they figured out how to get out of a situation when they bleed through their clothes. And it just wasn't super funny to me. I felt like the first half of the show, I liked it a lot more than that. But She goes into that and like tells a few more stories and then closes it out. All in all, the show was maybe an hour and 40 minutes. And to be honest, I was expecting it to be at least two hours because again, there's a two drink minimum and it was downtown. And so you had to use like a parking garage or pay for a lot. And then you had to walk to the venue, which for me, I parked right below the venue. It wasn't a far walk, but I, in my brain, most people who are going to see Rachel Hollis on a Wednesday night are not people who live downtown. They're probably people who had to come from surrounding towns like Mesa, Gilbert, for me, North Phoenix, which it wasn't that far of a drive, but it wasn't super convenient to like go down there on a Wednesday night for a show that was less than two hours long. Right. I just, I do wish it had been a little bit longer one. And I wish the concept had been a little bit more, a little bit stronger. It just felt weird and disjointed to have kind of those three distinct sections and it makes it hard to describe what the actual show is. But that's your answer of what even is the show. Took me about 10 minutes to tell you what it was, which maybe isn't great for promoing. Makes it a little bit confusing to figure out who your target audience is, but that's what it was. Another question was, is she being relatable with the quotes around it? Yes, very much so. That was a lot of her angle, especially in the first half, there were a lot of things that she brought up and she was like, who else, who else feels that? Who else has been through that? Who else experienced that? And she would have people like she would ask people to raise their hands if they had experienced it. Even one of the one of the stories she tells is about how when she first got married, she had the sexual experience of a sea slug and some of the same moves too, because she was a preacher's kid and her dad was a preacher's kid and she grew up in the church. Did anybody else grow up in the church? Any of you? Okay, so she was very much appealing to we've had these experiences. We've had these shared things happen to us. It's a room full of women. Women get their period, which a side note, not all women get their period. Not all women have uteruses or have periods. And so she thinks like she seemed to present it as that if that's the great unifier of all women. And I don't see it that way, but that was her approach. And so, yes. As much as Rachel says that if she's relatable, she's doing something wrong, she very much appeared to want to seem relatable in the show. 
Another question was, does she have a new MLM thing she's selling? And no, thankfully, she does not from from what I could tell. I mean, she didn't bring anything up related to it in the show. But I will never pass up the opportunity to remind everyone that she got a lot of money and a lot of praise and adoration for being the keynote speaker at MLM conferences only to a few years later write in a book to not be dumb and join an MLM because if you have to uh, create or like buy a starter kit, then it's not worth it. It's not something that you should join. Oh, and this is something that a lot of people were talking about. Um, Somebody asked, did you see Heidi? Yes, I did. When I first walked in, it was maybe... 10 minutes before the show started and I was looking around for her. I didn't see her at all when I first got there, but the room was actually surprisingly full. So I was like, maybe she's just, you know, somewhere in the back. I can't see her, whatever. I'm sure that I will see her at the end if she is here. I did end up seeing her at the end of the show. Um, Pretty quickly after the show ended, a lot of people started leaving and I just hung around for a little bit. And before the show had started, I don't know how it came up, but I was talking to the woman next to me and Heidi somehow came up. I had asked like, oh, did you, did you see her stories? Like, I'm wondering if she's actually going to be here. And the woman next to me said, yeah, like that's the reason that I knew that this show was happening. I mean, I'd heard about it before, but then Heidi's story reminded me that this was going on. And so I decided to come. And so the lady next to me was like, oh, look, there she is. Heidi's here. So I turned around. Heidi's standing up. There are people crowding around her. Not a massive number of people, but I mean, enough that people notice somebody's being crowded around and people were like in line to say hello to her. So Heidi was there. She was all smiles. She was more than happy to get the attention of the people who, I mean, a a good portion of them probably went because they saw her stories. I talked to three other people who said that the reason they came to the show was because Heidi had posted about it on her stories. And that's not to say that they only came for Heidi, because I don't even think the the three people who I had spoken to after the first woman, I don't think they even like went back to say hi to her. So it's like they probably follow both Rachel and Heidi, and maybe they knew about the show, maybe they didn't. But when they saw that Heidi was coming, they're like, oh, we should go. So that, that was kind of interesting. I mean, I thought it was weird that Heidi had posted about going and the way that she posted about going was like, come say hi to me. Come see this incredible mama do her thing. And then I'm going to be there so we can hang out. Like she didn't say Rachel's name once throughout her talking about going to this show. Um, and so it felt like her trying to kind of steal some of the spotlight because she knew that people would probably come because of her influence and because of the pull that she has on her own audience. But I guess in the end, it ended up resulting in more ticket sales for Rachel because whether they came to see Heidi or they came because Heidi made them aware of the show, they bought tickets and they came. Next question is, were you recognized by anyone there from Rachel's team? I don't think so. And if I was Nobody said anything, so I was very grateful that I was able to get in and get out without any sort of incident. The next question is, did she talk about Dave at all? She referenced Dave, but did not say his name and did not address that he had passed away. And while I do have my own opinion on it, I don't think it's my right to tell anybody how to speak about their own grief or how to speak about what they have experienced, especially when it comes to the passing of the father of your children. It did feel odd to me that she was telling stories about Dave without saying his name or without addressing it. But again, I, I'm not the one going through that. She is the one who's gone through it and is experiencing it and is now a single parent, even though she is you know, dating her boyfriend. That's not the father of her kids. And as flawed as he was, and as much as there was tension and toxicity abounding in their relationship, I, I can't comprehend what that loss is like. So yes, she referenced Dave. She told stories about when they first got married and um, you know, dating after divorce and stuff like that, but she did not say his name. 
there are a lot of questions that are kind of similar, so I'm not going to be able to answer every single one of them. I mean, I could, but it would be a little bit redundant. But kind of following that, uh, somebody asked, did she discuss Dave's death and being a single mother? Like I said before, she did not discuss him passing away. She did tell some parenting stories. Um, one of them in particular was about how Noah had got sent home with a note because she said the F word in class and the note that said, she said the F dash W O R D. And so I guess Noah had gone up to her boyfriend and was like, Kezi, can you sign this for me? And Rachel had overheard. And so like, she kind of told that story about him being a, a prominent presence in her kids lives. And it turns out the F word was freaking. It was not the actual F word, but how Rachel had like a freak out about it because she thought it was the actual F word. Um, but so she told some stories about her kids. She told another story about how they were at this resort and they were talking about another trip that they wanted to take and how Rachel wanted to do it a certain way, but they didn't necessarily have the money to do it right then. So she was going to put some money away and they would, you know, do the trip later so she could do it how she really wanted to do it. And her son called her a snob. And so she goes off about like, you're calling me a snob. You're eating $12 avocado toast. You have no money. I'm never going to go backwards. You've never had to stay in a Motel 6. I used to go from California to Oregon and that was an all-nighter trip. We weren't even stopping to you know, sleep in hotels. And, and she talked about how she refuses to go backwards. She's not going to settle for less than she wants. If she has to stay at a certain level that's fine. If she has to work a little bit harder to maintain that level until she can go forward in the way that she wants to, that's fine, but she'll never go back. And so she talked about how she works super hard to make sure that they're always either maintaining the, the things that they have and the level of luxury that they have in their lives until they can move forward. Another question said, how comfortable was the segue from humor to depth? I talked about it already when I was answering the first question, but I will reiterate, I was uncomfortable with it. I did not think that it went well, and I I wish that she had just stuck with things being funny and, and having a good time, because that's how it was promoted. It's like, it'll be motivational, it'll be fun, like, we're going to have a good time. But then it was just, it kind of felt like you were at a self-help seminar that somebody drug you along to, even if you're the one who bought the ticket yourself and decided to go. Another question that I've already kind of answered, but I'll just address again, is what was the vibe of the audience? I think for the first half, people were a little bit unsure of what to expect. But once Rachel started going, people got a little bit more and more comfortable and they were laughing and like looking at their friends or making eye contact with the people sitting next to them. It's like, okay, yeah, that's we're having a good time. But again, once it shifted, it felt like like to the Q&A section and then to the kind of motivational deep part, it did feel like a lot of the laughs were just kind of like, ha ha ha. I don't want to call them sympathy laughs or pity laughs, but they weren't coming as naturally as they had been once the show kind of got rolling and Rachel was telling her funny stories. A lot of people asked if Rachel's kids were there. And I know her oldest son was there because he was the one going around collecting the Q&A questions, but I didn't see him and I did not see any of her other kids. So I don't know if they were there. Someone asked, does Rachel give any valuable advice? Was it reiterated motivational stuff? To me, I did not find any of the advice valuable. I, I just didn't. I'm hoping that maybe some other people felt motivated by it or they felt like they got something out of the show because I'm assuming that the majority of them went because they look up to Rachel. And so I hope they felt like it was worth their time. Um, but for me... I think it's kind of hard for me to be like, I didn't get anything out of it. And I'm shocked because I criticized Rachel pretty openly on my channel. I, I have an issue with a lot of the things that she says and the generic life advice that she gives that she expects people to take as universal. And then when it doesn't work for them, it's like, well, you're not working hard enough. You're not getting up at 4 a.m. So, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a different position than presumably the typical audience member for this show. Okay, I have two more that are kind of unique questions from Instagram. Like I said, a lot of people asked sort of the same thing. So if I didn't read your exact question, it was just because in the course of filming this, I saw 
a similar question first, but I appreciate you for asking and I hope you got an adequate answer. But the second to last one that I'll answer from Instagram is, were there tons of body function slash fluid stories and did people actually laugh at them? So many. So many body function and fluid stories. I would say that there, I mean, Rachel talked about her pubic hair. She talked about the concept of people touching her boobs after divorce. She talked about, oh, (gasps) I left this part out. Oh my gosh. Okay. So in the first half of the comedy kind of section of the show, Rachel talks about how after she got divorced, she was the kind of girl who was like, not today, Satan, don't look at me. Uh, Like, you know, she, she thinks that every man wants her and she's not interested in any of them. And oh yeah, I bet you do offer secret sauce to every customer, Benjamin, but you're not fooling me. Keep your eyes to yourself. Like she's totally against it, doesn't want anything to do with it. Then at some point she realizes that, okay, she needs to date again. And at what point was this? Okay, so she decides to go skydiving and she tells an extremely uncomfortable story for me anyway. I was like, this is not appropriate. And again, like I'm not a, I'm not a prude, but I'm very much into like consent and respecting other people's boundaries. And so she tells a story about how she goes skydiving. And the first time you, you go skydiving, you have to do it with somebody strapped to your back. And when she went The guy who was going to be strapped to her back, the instructor, he was not cute. Think of your favorite IT guy and he has a pencil thin mustache and he was my height, but he was like 300 pounds and he was not cute, right? But when we got strapped together, I was like, oh, oh, and you get on the plane and oh, here I am, Santa, like sitting on his lap. He didn't ask her to, but she just felt that she should do that. And so she's like getting all excited, feeling all these things throughout this process of skydiving. And then when she lands on the ground, she's like, okay, yeah, I need to date somebody. That's weird. That's a weird story to me that like (laughs) the, the implications of getting aroused because somebody is doing their job and keeping you safe while you're skydiving for the first time. It made me uncomfortable. Anyway, some of the other stories she talked about were how when she joined Raya, there were a few people who asked her to be in threesomes. She talked a lot about her period and about how like nobody really educated her about her period and she didn't realize that you could get cramps anywhere other than your stomach and she thought at one point she was at Magic Mountain and she was experiencing something lower and she thought that her pad had flipped inside out and so she's like leading exercises with all the people in the line of like oh let's stretch out and she went to the bathroom and everything was good and then she realized like oh you can get cramps in other places. Then Then we get into her pointing out one of the few men there. His name is Lance. Lance, you were a good sport. I don't know if you enjoyed any part of that, but if you didn't, you have a great poker face because I was keeping an eye on you. You did a good job. But she talks about like Lance. Imagine if Lance got a period. Imagine if men could get period and one day they wake up and they feel a tingle in their butthole and they start realizing they're cramping and then they get cramps in their penis and then they start bleeding out clots the size of quarters and ambulances would be called. Things would come to a screeching halt. And it's just a it's a lot of gratuitous period talk. Again, if that's your brand of humor... I'm sure you loved the show, but for me, I'm just like, why are we doing this? What? There are so many other jokes that we could make, but this is what we're spending our time on. This is like your closing act of the show. This is your big story to bring down the house. You do you. And the last question I want to answer is, what was your vibe of the other attendees? Did anyone recognize you? And I've talked about this a little bit already about like how the vibe kind of shifted throughout the show. Overall, I think most people had a good time. I talked to some people on the way to my car and I'd ask them like, oh, were you just at the show? And They said yes, and I asked if they liked it, what they thought about it, and they said that it was really funny. They weren't expecting it to be that humorous or for Rachel to be that funny, but she was amazing, and they had a great time. So overall, even though I felt like things were uncomfortable at some point, 
there were people who genuinely had a great time. And also, as far as anybody recognizing me, I don't think anyone recognized me, but I do just want to say, if you're ever out in public and you see me, feel free to say hi. I've had a few people DM me on Instagram and be like, were you over here at this store or at this restaurant? Because I feel like I saw you, but I wasn't sure and I didn't want to bug you if it was you. Feel free. Like, I'm out and about. <laughs> I am out and about town. If you see me, don't hesitate because I would love to meet you and say hello. Okay, so I'm looking at the questions on my community tab and a lot of these have already been answered. Like they're very similar to questions that were answered on Instagram. So I don't want to belabor any of the talking points, but there was one that I specifically wanted to read out. And again, parts of this were already answered, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but there is a specific part of one of these questions that I do want to answer. And the question in its entirety is, I have so many questions. Did she really approach it like a comedy routine and use the period blood and lady parts bits? Did it go over well? Did people laugh? Do you think she's attracting a new crowd with this or is it more like the remnants of her old fan base? Did she mention Dave at all or use her private life as bait at all? How did the Q&A go? How did you like it? And the part that I wanted to answer in this is, do you think she's attracting a new crowd with this or is it more like the remnants of her old fan base? Obviously, I can't speak for everyone who was there, but I got the feeling that a lot of the people who came were people who already knew who Rachel was. And of the people that I spoke with, they didn't seem to be like her hardcore fans. None of them had seen Rachel live before. It was more so like, oh, I know who Rachel is. I follow her and, oh, she's going to be in Phoenix and it's a reasonable price. I have the night free. Yeah, I might as well go. Maybe it'll be fun. So it's not like the people who are hardcore Rachel followers. I'm sure there were some of those people there, but I don't think it's a new audience of any kind. To be honest, the way that she promoted it if I was just like a regular person looking for something to do on a Wednesday night, I wouldn't see the promo for that and be like, oh, that looks like it'll be a good show. It, it The way it's promoted is just kind of confusing and I wouldn't know what I was getting myself into. And so just me as an average consumer, I if I didn't know who Rachel was, I can't say there's anything about the marketing that would have drawn me in to buying a ticket. And a final note on the pricing is that while the tickets were $35, it ended up being closer to like $47 with taxes and fees. And then additionally, there was a two drink minimum. And so you had to buy stuff while you were there. Plus with the event being downtown, if you drove there, you had to pay for parking. And it, again, it wasn't like an outrageous expense, but overall I spent close to $100 for a show that was less than two hours long and wasn't super like fleshed out in my opinion. And that's kind of backed up by her saying she rewrote the show multiple times that day. And so she hopes we like it. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But that's what she said at the beginning of the show. So it just kind of felt like things were not super well put together. And honestly, if I had gone because I thought that I was going to have the most amazing time, I probably would have left being like, I could have spent that hundred bucks on something else. I mean, I could have spent that hundred bucks on something else, but I'm not as disappointed because I wasn't expecting to go and love the show. So that was my experience seeing Rachel Hollis live. And the last thing I will say is that, you know, that was the first time I'd ever seen her live in person. And when she walked out on stage, I was like, oh my God, she's so cute. <laughs> and I don't know why I was surprised because... I know what Rachel looks like. She's a beautiful woman, but she's just like short and tiny. And when she walked out, I was just like, oh, she's a little cutie. It doesn't change the way that I feel about her, but I was just surprised at how she appears in person compared to how she appears on the internet or on Instagram. It was just an interesting thing to see, but that's it for this video. Let me know your thoughts on everything down below. If you are planning on going to her show, if she comes to your city, I want to hear about it. If you saw her in New York or LA, share the experience in the comments section. And uh, while you're doing that, if you would consider liking this video or subscribing to my channel, 
that would be incredible. And if you are listening to the podcast, if you would consider leaving it a rating or a review, I would be so appreciative. And if you've done any of those things already, thank you so much. I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.